New York Comic Con Live presented by Fandom and Twitch. We have a very, very special guest here for you and quite a crowd to see him presenting Mr. Stan Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank and you. I'm joined, of course, by Marcus DJ. We glad to be here. here on the stage. We are so excited to meet you, Stan, and we are so glad that you're here at Comic Con. What has the experience at Comic Con been like so far? Nobody wanted me to do it. My publisher, when I suggested the idea, he said, that's the worst thing I ever heard of. Why? People hate spiders. You can't call a hero Spider-Man. When I said I wanted him to be a teenager, that's where he started, he said to me, you don't understand, Stan. A teenager can only be a sidekick. He can't be the hero. Robin. Then, right, then when I said I want him to have a lot of personal problems and nothing ever <laughs> goes right from, he said, Stan, don't you know what a hero is? So he wouldn't let me do it. I had to wait till later. We had a book we were going to drop, and when you do the last issue of a book, nobody you call cares. Books, right? uh, well, I call it a comic book, yeah. Nobody cares what you put into it, so I featured Spider Man on the cover, and I forgot about it. Well, a month later, the sales figures came in. It had been our biggest seller. So my publisher came to me and said, Stan, do you remember that character that we both liked so much, Spider Man? <laughs> Why don't you do it, Siri? Here we are. Here we are. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Thank you. <laughs> What's up? You have to have a All right. What's up? How y'all doing out there? All right. All right. Make it good. Remember, I'm watching. Reach to other people. But at the same time, I feel there are kind of universal truths that nobody could quibble with. Like, to me, uh, the most important mantra in the world is do unto others what you'd have them do unto you. I, mean, I don't see how anybody could take issue with that, and I try to follow that, and I think if everybody followed it, this would be a, the world would be paradise if you'd never treat anybody the way you didn't want to be treated. So that that's about as far as I get into religion, just I was opposed to bigotry, as opposed to cruelty, I was opposed to demeaning women or um, other sexes or not other sexes, or other races or colors or creeds. So I would try occasionally to bring those themes into the book. Now very often I'd get fan mail from people. What is your religion? What do you think of Christianity as opposed to Judaism, as opposed to Buddhism? Never got into that because I didn't feel it was our place to get into that sort of thing. So earlier today, it was announced that Stan Lee passed away, which sucks. I mean, I never knew Stan Lee personally. Like, I, I never actually, like, well, I met him, but I, I didn't know Stan. I knew Stan Lee as much as I knew anybody else. Like, you know, I, I knew about his career and his contributions, but I never knew him on a personal level. Um, but, you know, meeting Stan Lee was was amazing. And, and we'll, we'll talk more about that here in a second. But... So so let's let's wind the clock back, right? Wind the clock back a little while. So Stan Lee graduates high school in like 1939, right? And becomes an assistant at what was Timely Comics at the time. Now, Timely Comics was the predecessor to Marvel, right? For those of you guys who were unfamiliar with, with comic book history, the way this played out is you had Superman who came onto the scene in 1938, right? You know, you had Superman in 1938, you had Batman in 1939, 1940, and you had, uh, and, and you had like, you know, Wonder Woman and, and Aquaman and a handful of others, and you had Captain America, and you had Name of the Submariner, and for the most part, by the time 1941 hit, the comic book industry was off to the races. It was the silver age, or the golden age of comics. You know, and, and by and large, comic book superheroes were intertwined with World War II, right? I mean, they were a reflection of, of the Total War effort and, you know, American patriotism and so on and so forth. But, but Stan Lee was there throughout the whole thing. You know, while he was an assistant, he had a couple writing credits to his name. You know, he had some writing credits to Captain America. He had some writing credits and backup features. But he was by no means, you know, a, a Joe Simon or somebody like that. He wasn't on the same level as, as guys like that, you know, Sheldon Meyer, people like that. Because he just wasn't contributing in that same fashion. And, of course, by the time the, the, the early 1940s turned into the mid-1940s, turned into the late 1940s, comic books were, or at least superheroes, were basically dying out. Right, you know, I mean, you know, World War II was over. People saw comic book superheroes as being intertwined with World War II, and they didn't really want to read stories about guys who were fighting against, you know, whatever craziness was going on. Instead, they wanted to let their imaginations run wild. 
right? You know, so all the Edmund Hamiltons and these guys started taking over and then science fiction became the name of the game. And so going into the 1950s, Stan Lee's efforts as an assistant with Timely Comics began to pay off in the sense that Timely Comics under, uh, under Martin Goodman, you know, under Magazine Management Incorporated, rebranded itself. And it was no longer timely. It was now Atlas Publications. And Atlas Publications is basically uh, publishing comics in almost every genre except for superheroes. Westerns and science fiction and horror and all that kind of stuff. And Stan Lee had writing credits to all of those. He contributed to so many of those stories in the 1950s. So that by the time the early 1960s came around, he was an established writer with some clout. And so in, in 1956, DC, uh, you know, uh, I guess editor-in-chief Julius Schwartz sat down and said, okay, what would happen if we took science fiction and we blended it with superheroes and then release it to the public? What would happen if we did that? And they said, well, we have a lot of comics called DC Showcase. Let's experiment and find out. So with the fourth issue, DC Showcase number four, Julius Schwartz introduces Barry Allen, and that reignites interest in superheroes. Bam! Superheroes are right back onto the scene again. The people are just like, man, this is crazy. Well, well, magazine management was looking for a way to compete with that. They were looking for a way to, to create something that could make them a viable competitor to DC Comics. And this was about six years after the introduction of Barry Allen that this actually happened. Well, about you know five years, something along those lines. Because between 1956 and 1960, DC was just like cranking out a whole new era of superheroes or reworking existing heroes, right? You know, Barry Allen gets introduced in DC Showcase number four. Hal Jordan's introduced not long after that. So the Green Lantern mythos is reworked. Uh, Superman's origin is retold to include like the fact that on Krypton, Kryptonians had no powers because of a red sun. On Earth, Superman has powers because of a yellow sun. All these different things were like, were, were mixed in and thrown together. Origins were retold. Characters were expanded. Science fiction was added to their publications and it was hugely popular. And so by 1960, with Brave and the Bold going into their own solo series, Justice League had like blown up on the scene, right? And so Stan Lee goes to Martin Goodman and says, we have a way to compete. And the question is, how do we do that? And he say, we create a superhero team of our own. But for Stan Lee, you go back and you look at any of the interviews, go back and look at, at any of the interviews he'd done with Larry King, any of those guys. And the one thing he'll always harp on is that he never viewed superhero comics as being something that should be too grounded in the real world. It should be grounded in the real world insofar as it's relatable. But the world was already dark enough as it was. We were post-World War II, which meant we were in the middle of the Cold War. You had McCarthyism and the Red Scare. And people, you know, Stanley wanted to create stories that people could look at as an escape from what was essentially considered to be the terrors of the real world. And so Stanley said, okay, let's create the, the Fantastic Four. Let's create, a, let, let's create a team called the Fantastic Four. But it's not going to be like the Justice League. The Justice League is wholesome. They get along together and they work together and all that kind of good, you know, all that kind of good stuff, all that kind of cool stuff. And the Fantastic Four will do that. But what if they're like a family? And what if like every family everywhere, they, they bicker and they argue and they squabble? What if we do that? Throw that into the story and see what happens. Stanley and Jack Kirby get together. They release Fantastic Four number one and it sells like gangbusters. It explodes off. I mean, it just blows off the shelves. And, and it's, it's insanely popular. At that point, Martin Goodman was like, do what, do what you want to do. And so under Stanley and Jack Kirby, who essentially become the one-two punch of the comic book industry, I mean, guys like Steve Ditko and, and Steve Engel, Englehart and Roy Thomas, they were huge contributors, you know, but by and large, you had Stanley and Jack Kirby who were heads and shoulders of everybody else. But under those two guys, we got Captain America who returned in Avengers number four. We got the Avengers title. Earth's mightiest superheroes banding together to face off against various threats. And it was composed of characters who already had their own solo series. Name with the Submariner, Iron Man, Thor, who was popular in Journey into Mystery. Under these guys, superheroes became this sort of fantasy element. Became like these really, really cool, interesting concepts. And they set the groundwork for everything that would come after with Marvel Comics. The success of Marvel as it exists now is built on the shoulders of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. It's built on the work that they put in. It's built on the stories they told. And it really sucks to lose someone who's that big of a contributor to the comic book landscape. It's somebody who's been reading comics for so long. It sucks to lose somebody like that, you know, because it's just like this guy had a huge hand in, in evolving the industry as it exists. But the good thing is that I did get to meet Stan Lee once. 
<laughs> and it was actually kind of interesting. First time I ever met Stan Lee. You know, first and only time I actually ever met Stan Lee. And it was, it was, it was wild because it was something that I'd always wanted to do. In reality, I never pursued an autograph of Stan Lee to, res uh, you know, to, to sell it or anything like that. I always pursued it just for the sake of having it. I want to be able to say, I have something autographed by Stan Lee. And so I was living in Kentucky at the time. And, and a buddy of mine, Gordon, says, hey, man, like, like we have fan, like I'm running Fan Expo in Louisville, Kentucky. And I say, what the hell is Fan Expo? And he says, you know, what's, 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 what's that? And he's like, well, think of like Fan Expo in Canada, but like on a smaller scale. And he's like, it's right across the street from Kentucky Kingdom. So literally you can come out here and you can go to Fan Expo and then like go to Kentucky Kingdom, which is what a lot of people do. Or a lot of people did at the time. And so I was like, yeah, sure, man, because they had Stan Lee who was coming out there. And he was like, well, that's, that's always going to be the big draw. Like get a lot of people out there, you know, a lot of people to check it out. And so... I buy tickets, I roll out there, and and I get out there and realize the comic that I wanted Stan Lee to autograph, I'd left at home. That was this comic. Fantastic Four Annual Number 2. This is the original origin of Doctor Doom told by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Funny enough, this origin came out two years after Doctor Doom originally debuted because they didn't know what, his, what they wanted his origin to be. They had no clue what they wanted him to be. They were just kind of like, hey, here's a guy who's just like about as smart as Reed Richards and usually is as smart, sometimes smarter depending on what the story calls for. Super dangerous and he's basically a blend of like traditional powers and sorcery. And so he's like, what if Harry Potter met superheroes? And was like evil. Okay, so what if Voldemort met superheroes and like wore a metal suit? It's kind of what Doctor Doom is. Except, uh, I think I hit the microphone. <laughs> except that Doctor, except Voldemort didn't have the same kind of one liner, one liners Doctor Doom has. Doctor Doom had. There's this amazing moment from Jonathan Hickman's Avengers: New Avengers. Kind of sidetrack here for a second. There's this amazing moment where Doctor Doom's talking to Namor the Submariner, and he's talking about being a king, talking about being a ruler, and and. You know, he's, you know, he's like, he's like, you know, Namor asked him, he's like, are you really going to sit here and feast in this fashion while you have people out there, you know, who are, who aren't feasting in the same capacity you are? And Dr. Doom asked a question. He says, do you really believe that if they chose to, that they would not be able to rise up and overthrow me? He's like, he's like, I'm Dr. Doom. Like, you know, yes, I rule upon high, but I, I protect my people. I keep them safe. I give them a better life. So yes, Dr. Doom eats first. And he eats the very best. <laughs> and I'm just like, Dr. Doom, you're a dick. But I love you for being a dick. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty funny. It was pretty amazing. Anyway, yeah, so I wanted to get that, that, get that comic signed. And, and I was so heartbroken that I left it at home. It was just like, damn, man, that sucks. And I don't want to drive like an hour all the way back and then an hour all the way there. And so I was like, okay, whatever, you know, I'll just grab a comic while I'm there. And so I'm, I'm going through and I find a variant cover for Superior Iron Man. Those of you guys who never read Superior Iron Man, it's one of the coolest stories ever. Um, it's, it's, basically Iron Man becomes a dick. Like he becomes like Iron Man from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but just more of a jerk. And so it was, it was a crazy experience, right? Because they have the table set up in the back, and it's like obviously this is where Stanley's going to be. It's it's the biggest section of the of the whole venue, and so there's like this line of people, this like huge line of people to get in. Now I never had anything autographed by Stan Lee. Keep that in mind. Never had anything autographed by Stan Lee, and so so I'm standing in this line of people, and they they like they bring Stan Lee out, and and like everybody's like cheering. I'm just like yeah, man, Stan Lee, dude, Stan Lee. Like I'm just like ah, Stan Lee. Like I'm, I'm I was I was pretty hyped. I was really really excited. So they bring him out, and of course like the guy he's pretty old at the time. I mean this was this was you know five years ago. So he was he was still well into his nineties, and so um, and so they 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 bring him out. They have him sit down at the table, and they have like this huge bodybuilder guy. I'm just like, dude, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not going to mess with that guy. I mean, that guy's huge. I mean, look, like I'll, I'll jump into the thick of it just like, you know, with anybody else. But like, I wouldn't intentionally look to pick a fight with that guy. <laughs> So here's so so you have you have a guy who checks the comic right so like you show up with your comic you have a guy who checks the comic he looks over to make sure there's no like razor blades or anything in there uh, you know because I imagine there's probably just crazy people out there he passes the comic to Stan Lee Stan Lee autographs it like you can say a few words like hey man I really really love your stuff before Stan Lee's even done signing it the bodyguard guy has his hand on the on the comic and then like as soon as Stan Lee's done he's like here you go like hands it off to me and it's just like damn like this is <laughs> this is like assembly line but it kind of makes sense too because you're talking about like one of the most popular popular contributors to the history of comic books doing autographs, of course there's going to be like a madhouse. It's going to be insane, like a huge line of people. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's – the cool thing is I got to meet Stan Lee once. And, and there's just – there's just something about having – you know, it's, it's – there's just something about being able to say that I was part of something that one man helped to usher. It's just – 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't really know how to express that, but but you look at the kind of things Stan Lee did and him alongside, you know, Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and Roy Thomas and Steve Englehart and Steve Gerber. And you, you look at all these guys who have contributed to the, to the, you know, to the Marvel landscape over the years. And you say, wow, you know, that a person could achieve that much success, that a person could have that huge of an impact on a singular genre is astounding to me. You know, it's, it's incredible to me. And so, so this, this is, this video is really to Stan Lee, you know, like, it, you know, the, the world has lost an incredible person person. The world's lost uh, uh, an awesome human being, you know, a great guy, you know, that, that, that really, that brought comics to life in a way that for me, despite the fact that while he was writer was long before my time, what he did was set in stone alongside so many other writers and artists creating a genre that I have been, that, that, that I have spent more time reading than I haven't read, than I haven't been reading, right? Like, you know, I read, I've started reading comics when I was like 11 years old. I'm 34 years old now, you know? So, well, 10 years old, roughly, you know, so I'm, I'm 34 years old now, but you know, I spent more time reading comics than I haven't read comics. And so much of that is because of the, the early work that Stan Lee put in so much of it is because of the early work that they managed to, to get together and they managed to sort out. So Stan Lee, this one's for you, man. Like it, it, it sucks that you're gone, but just know like, you know, Stan Lee's leaving behind an incredible legacy that, that so many people like myself can experience and enjoy and, and be a part of. So Stan Lee, rest in peace, man. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you're in a better place. So yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so I will catch you all later. Peace.